screen? Yeah, we we can see. Awesome. Okay, so the paper that I'm going to present today is uh, Neural Constraints on Learning, and this is a paper that was published in 2014. So I actually first uh, found out about this kind of uh, work when I was in my third year, and I was doing a summer internship at Janelia, and we can talk more about that later, how I got it, what internships are good to do, and so on. Happy to get into that. But uh, so I was uh, here during my third year, the summer between third year and fourth year. Um, and this person, uh, Byron Yu, he came to Janelia and gave a talk about this work. And I just found it so exciting that I kind of uh, read the paper. I discussed the paper with, my, uh, with the people in the lab that I was working in. And I found it very interesting. And I still think it's very relevant and interesting. So that's why I kind of decided to share it with you guys, because I think it's a very nice paper to read as an undergrad and to really kind of get excited about um, the things that you can do with neuroscience. OK? So um, to begin with, I'm going to go to a bit of history. So this is a figure from a paper from 1969. So that's, uh, what, 60 years ago now. Uh, or 50 years ago, sorry. Um, and what's happening in this figure is called operant conditioning. So I don't know if you guys have done psychology. Uh, if you know what operant conditioning is, then this is quite similar to that, except that here you're trying to make the animal uh, change the activity of neurons in its brain rather than its behavior. So in a normal operant conditioning, you have something like a uh, rat learns to press a lever in order to get food. And then that's the lever pressing is the behavior that conditions, right? But over here, what you're conditioning is this average firing rate of a neuron. So I assume that you all know that uh, neurons fire action potentials and that's how neurons communicate with each other. And if you want me to explain more about that, then I can go there. But for now, I'm assuming that everyone knows what neuron and action potentials means. Um, so what's happening here is that there's one single neuron being recorded with an electrode and the per scientist is measuring the firing rate of that single neuron. So that's what's on the y-axis and this neuron fires something like between 10 spikes per second and 30 spikes per second. And I'll use spikes and action potential interchangeably. Um, and then what the scientist does is, if the firing rate of this neuron crosses some threshold, like 20, um, 25 uh, per action potentials per second, so 25 spikes per second is the firing rate, then they give the monkey some food pellets. So that's a reward for the monkey, right? The monkey likes to get that. And then what they find is that they're able to uh, teach the monkey to actually control the firing rate of this individual neuron in order to get food. So when the monkey gets food by raising the firing rate of the neuron, it learns to do that. So you can see that the firing rate goes up in this phase. And then there's another phase called extinction, where the relationship between uh, firing rate and food is removed. So you may start giving the monkey food at random time, right? when there's no um, high or low firing rate. It doesn't depend anymore on the firing rate. So the monkey will stop controlling the firing rate of that neuron. It's called extinction. Then what happens uh, in the next phase, you give the monkey clicks when uh, the firing rate of the neuron goes up. Now these clicks are irrelevant to the monkey. It's not a rewarding stimulus for the monkey. So he does not do anything to that firing rate of that neuron. And then again, you have some extinction when all the clicks are coming randomly. So nothing happens really in these two phases. And then in the last phase, you do pellets and clicks. So this is basically trying to illustrate that the monkey can control the firing rate of that neuron uh, when the, uh, there's some reward related to the firing rate of that neuron being high or low. And in this phase where the, there's like clicks which are not rewarding and doesn't do anything and the clicks don't affect the way that the monkey can con uh, control this neuron's firing rate. So that's the details of the figure. And now if you step back a little and think about what's happening here, it's actually really fascinating. So the monkey brain has billions of neurons, but it's able to control the firing rate of a single neuron in its brain just because that neuron happens to be the one that the researcher is recording with an electrode and the researcher has conditioned the um, 
uh, rewarding food on the firing rate of that neuron. So think about it. It would be as if, you know, you're, um, you can't even really feel the firing rate of a single neuron, right? You never know, is this part of my brain more active or is this part? There's no actual perception of this. But somehow you realize that when you think in a certain way or when you imagine a particular thing or when you make a particular movement, like depending on which part of the brain the electrode is in, that you're getting food. And then you keep doing that. So you have the ability to uh, manipulate your neural activity. You can learn how to manipulate your neural activity by doing this kind of conditioning. So that's really interesting. And it's sort of the start of this whole brain-computer interface paradigm. So um, now I'll explain what that means. But first, uh, sort of what are the questions that are motivating this uh, study? So going uh, big, big picture. Uh, so brains come hardwired. So what does that mean? Basically, when you're born, uh, there's already a lot of fixed wiring between the various neurons in your brain, right? And this is something that has been developed over an evolutionary time scale. So ever since we evolved from single cells to humans, these connections have uh, kind of fallen into place and gotten fixed. So for example, uh, your retina, which is the neural level of your eye, is connected to a nucleus in the thalamus called LGN. And doesn't matter what exactly this is, but basically it's an um, intermediate part of the brain which uh, processes visual information, which is then connected to the visual cortex. And then your visual cortex is connected to your prefrontal cortex, which actually interprets those uh, images and what it means when you see something uh, with your eyes. So this connection is hardwired the moment uh, an animal is born. All animals uh, have this, or not all animals, but at least let's say all animals beyond a certain evolutionary level have these connections already fixed. Retina, LGN, visual cortex, prefrontal cortex. That's not going to change over the course of your lifetime, okay? And these are what we call long range connections between uh, regions, but then there are also local connections within regions. So within your retina, there are some connections between the neurons, which are also hardwired. So they can't change over your lifetime. But then you have some limited flexibility over your lifetime, which allows you to learn things. And for example, within this circuit, what can happen is over time, you can develop something like a Jennifer Aniston neuron. So if you guys know about this, this is a very famous experiment that was done uh, in humans who were getting surgery for epilepsy. So they actually had a human who was awake and they had electrodes in some part of the prefrontal cortex of this person. And they showed lots of images and words and things on the screen. And they found a neuron which would fire whenever the person saw a picture of Jennifer Aniston. And it would also fire when the person saw the name Jennifer Aniston written down in text on the screen and so on. So basically, this is a neuron which has learned a concept, Jennifer Aniston. And it fires whenever the person sees a picture of her or her name written down or movies that she's been in or something like that. So uh, now, obviously, this. Um, property of this neuron cannot be hardwired from birth, right? Because uh, when a person is born, they have no idea about this concept, Jennifer Aniston. And the connections that create this uh, neuron's properties are learned over the lifetime. So there are certain uh, patterns that if you see a picture of Jennifer Aniston, there are certain patterns that form on your retina. And then uh, those neurons are connected to the LGN in some way. Then the visual cortex puts all of those patterns together to form a picture. And then finally, the prefrontal cortex combines the visual information with also other things like uh, text of her name or like hearing her name spoken or seeing a movie or something, which creates this Jennifer Aniston concept. And then uh, you have a Jennifer Aniston neuron in your prefrontal cortex. So there's some clearly some flexibility that allows us to learn things over our lifetime. Right? So these connections are non-existent when you're born and they're developed over time. Now the question is, how much flexibility do we have? So we clearly know that there are hardwired connections, there's flexibility. How much of the uh, connections can change? And in what ways can they change? So what aspects of neural activity are hardwired versus flexible? Like uh, you can imagine that if you try to impose some kind of completely random uh, firing pattern, so you want this particular neuron to fire at 100 uh, action potentials per second and another neuron to fire at one action potential per second and so on. You impose a completely random firing pattern on the whole brain. That might not be possible for the brain to reproduce because there are already some fixed 
uh, correlations between different neurons by virtue of the hardwired connectivity. But clearly, there's some flexibility as well. So this paper is really trying to explore um, in what way is the neural activity fixed and in what way is it flexible? Right? What can we learn? What can't we learn? In other words, what are the neural constraints on learning? So that was the introduction. And please ask if you are confused about anything here. OK, yeah. So we have a question from Avani Kulkarni. Yeah. Uh, what about neural plasticity? Isn't it about making new connection, connections within? Yeah, exactly. So neural plasticity refers to uh, changing uh, connections between neurons. And that's exactly what I mean by flexibility. So uh, neural plasticity occurs uh, when, I mean, it can occur at any time during your life, even up to adulthood. But there are some connections that are not plastic or there are, each connection is plastic up to a certain range. So for instance, if a person becomes blind, okay, uh, suddenly the retina is not getting any input anymore. Let's say you had some injury to your eye or something, you became blind. Now these connections between the retina, IG and visual cortex, prefrontal cortex, they are now useless because you're not getting any visual input. And then what usually happens is that the visual cortex, instead of getting an input from the retina, it starts getting input from your uh, ears or your skin. Basically your um, brain, Re recruit the useless part of the visual cortex to do other sensory processing. So that's uh, neural plasticity, right? Changing of connections. And we know that when a person goes blind, that that kind of plasticity is actually possible. So, but there are some kinds of plasticities that are not possible. For example, if a person is not blind, then these connections can't change. You can't uh, learn not to respond to your retina in your visual cortex. Uh, so that's the question. What is plastic? What is not plastic? Or if you go within a certain brain region, uh, what aspects of the connectivity are flexible and what is not flexible? Is that, does that answer the question? Okay. Um, Okay, so I'll now move on to the actual paper. So brain-computer in interface can be used to answer this question of how much flexibility is there. So basically what a brain-computer interface is in very simple words, you record some neural activity using electrodes. So in this case, there's a monkey who is uh, sitting in a fixed position and you have some electrodes in the brain and you're recording neural activity. So uh, here, each row is a particular neuron that's being recorded, and the x-axis is time. And then each line here is a single action potential. So you can see that there's like a generally low firing rate at this time, and then something happens, which makes all the neurons fire a bit more at this time, and so on. Right? So there's neural activity versus time. And then you take this neural activity, you uh, do some processing on it. It's called a BCI mapping. And then you use it to move a cursor on a screen. So in this case, a monkey is actually watching the screen. The blue dot is a cursor on the screen that can move around. And these uh, gray positions are always fixed. So these are not moving. And what, what uh, the BCI part of this is that the velocity of this blue cursor depends in some way on the neural activity. So for those of you who know a little bit about uh, like PCA and um, dimensionality of vectors, you can think of the neural activity versus time as a very high dimensional vector. So if you take any single time point, then uh, let's say you're recording 100 neurons, you have a 100 dimensional vector, which is the neural activity of each of those 100 neurons. And then you can do a, a mapping of that 100 dimensional vector into a 2D vector, which is the velocity of this cursor on the screen, right? So you would have a 100 cross 2 matrix that you would multiply with the neural activity to get a two-dimensional vector called, which is the um, cursor velocity. And so what is going to happen is that the cursor is going to move on the screen in a way that depends on the neural activity of the neurons that are being recorded. Uh, and the cool thing is that monkeys can actually learn to control the cursor on the screen really well using this kind of uh, mapping from neural activity to cursor velocity. And that's the thing that we're going to look at today. Um, so now, 
uh, in this paper, they actually record usually around uh, 90 neurons at a time, and the cursor moves on a 2D screen. But for the purposes of our presentation, I'm going to make it much dumber. I'm going to think of only two neurons. So imagine that we're recording neuron one and neuron two. This is the firing rate of neuron one on the x-axis, firing rate of neuron two on the y-axis. And each black point in this figure is the uh, firing rates of neuron one and neuron two at a particular time, okay? So let's say uh, I record these neurons for a minute and then in each second, I plot the average firing rate in that second of neuron one and neuron two as one of the points here. And then what I'm gonna do is a simple one dimensional cursor movement just for our purposes of understanding. So this blue dot again is the cursor and it can move left or right. There are two targets that uh, the monkey has to acquire, left or right, okay? Okay, um, again, I'll pause for a second if there's any question. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce the concept of intrinsic manifold. And this is a little bit complicated. So try um, to understand with a simple example. So if you think of this uh, neural activity that we're measuring, neuron one and neuron two, what you can see is that there seems to be some sort of line here that I haven't put points arbitrarily anywhere in this uh, graph. There's only points in this quadrant and this quadrant, if you think of the graph as being divided into four quadrants. So what that means is, when the firing rate of neuron one is high, the firing rate of neuron two is low. There's never any uh, time points where uh, over here, like the firing rate of neuron one and neuron two are both low at the same time. That doesn't happen. Uh, it, uh, doesn't happen in these two neurons that we happen to be recording in this time that we were recording. And similarly, when the firing rate of neuron two is high, the firing rate of neuron one is low. So it just doesn't happen that both these neurons have high firing rate at the same time. In other words, the firing rate of neuron one and neuron two are anti-correlated with each other, right? So when one goes up, the other one goes down. Uh, and you can think of the neural activity as falling along this uh, line uh, here. Now, what that means is that the number of neurons is two, but the intrinsic dimensionality of this neural activity is one. And uh, basically what it means is that you can describe the neural activity at any time as the point on this line that's closest to the neural activity. So for instance, if you think of this point over here, okay, because you ask what was the uh, neural activity at this time, instead of telling you the activity of both neuron one and neuron two, so that will be two numbers, I can give you a single number, which is the distance on this line from the bottom. So I can say that uh, this at this time, the neural activity is close to the bottom of this red line. Uh, then I can say at this time, the neural activity is far from the bottom of this line, right? And so what it means is that the position along this line will give you all the information you need. There's very little information that you won't get from that one uh, number description, one dimensional description of the neural activity. So for instance, if I say that uh, uh, dis the uh, distance of uh, neural activity um, uh, at a time 100 seconds from here is very high, then most of the points that are very high are gonna be these, right? So you know that uh, the neural activity that I'm describing is one of these points. It's not gonna be somewhere here or somewhere here because that kind of neural activity does not exist uh, in this uh, picture. So the intrinsic dimensionality of the activity of these two neurons is one. Um, is that understandable? I've tried to make it like super simple with just two neurons and one dimension. So if anyone's having a problem understanding that, please tell me and I'll try to explain better. So, okay. Um, so in this toy example that I've taken, uh, the number of neurons is two and the intrinsic dimensionality is one. But in the actual data that was recorded in this paper, the number of neurons that they record is 90 and the intrinsic dimensionality is 10. So now this is very hard to visualize. You can't really imagine what a 90 dimensional neural activity space looks like. And then within that, there's some smaller 10 dimensional space where all the points can be found. 
but an easy way to think of it is that uh to describe the activity at any time you don't need 90 numbers you only need 10 numbers um if that makes sense so i'll pause for questions over here because this is a little bit of a difficult concept yeah we uh, have doubt from akhilesh sayade uh, were neurons recorded here belong to the motor cortex yes here they are recording neurons from motor cortex like you've read the paper that's so awesome. uh and uh, my second question was like uh, is this a uh, a uh, uh, concept behind pca because uh, as far as i know uh, like when we have a high dimensional data we try to like uh, get some useful features from them and try to have uh, try to get a lower dimensional data that is more useful for us so uh, like that's exactly the concept behind pca so if you've done pca uh, before then you already understand what i'm talking about here thank you yeah so if you were trying to do pca uh, of this neural data you would have two principal components right one would be this red line and then the other one would be a line that's orthogonal to this and you would have very high variance along the first principal component and very low variance along the second principal component if you don't if you haven't done pca then don't worry about that it doesn't matter okay a anything else okay i'll move on um okay so now uh, the neural activity is mapped onto the cursor velocity right so how does that work so in this case what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, map the neural activity along this intrinsic dimension so i'm going to say that when neuron 1 is high and neuron 2 is low so all of these points highlighted in black the cursor is going to move towards the right so if the animal is instructed to try and move the cursor to this right target then it needs to make neuron 1 fire at a high rate and neuron 2 fire at a low rate and similarly uh, in the opposite direction if neuron 1 is low and neuron 2 is high then the cursor is going to move to the left so i basically i'm drawing a threshold over here and i'm saying if the point is on this side of the threshold cursor will move left and if the point is on this side of the threshold cursor will move right okay so in this task let's assume that the animal is supposed to move the cursor right so what it would do is um uh, try and get the activity in this part of the uh, space and then the cursor would move to the right and the target could be acquired now uh, the finding is that animals can do this very well so the way that they look at that is they look at two measures one is the success rate which means the number of trials on which the animal is able to successfully do this and the second thing is the acquisition time which is in green so this plot has oh, sorry this plot has two y axes so one is the success rate one is the acquisition time um and uh, so what you can see is that in any given trial in something like one second the animal is able to take a cursor from the center and move it to the target when you have this kind of mapping okay and the success rate is 100% which means that uh, this happens on every single trial that the animal does and uh, a concept of a trial is basically to separate the experiment into usable uh, chunks so the cursor appears in the middle of the screen and then the animal has some time to move it to a target and that's a trial and then in the next trial again the cursor will appear in the middle of the screen and the animal will uh, try to move it and of course if the animal manages to do it correctly he'll get a reward which is typically food right so that's the incentive of the animal to achieve this kind of performance in this task okay so this is simple for the animal to do now what one can do as an experiment or because this is a brain computer interface and we control this mapping this left right depending on the neural activity is under our control so we can basically um flip it around okay so now i'll say that uh, just going back and forth so that you can see what i've done um now i'm going to say that uh, when the neuron 1 activity is high and neuron 2 activity is low instead of going to the right the uh, cursor is going to move to the left so the monkey is used to doing something like this to move the cursor right but uh, now what's going to happen is it's going to try to do this it's expecting the cursor to go to the target but the cursor is going to go in the opposite direction so basically we have flipped the contingency and so as predicted you can see that the success rate goes down so this black line it used to be 100% and now it's fallen down to something like 50% um 
and the acquisition time goes up. So instead of taking something like one second, it's like quickly going to the right. It uh, first goes left and it will move around somewhere randomly and somehow it will achieve the target in something like three, two to three seconds. Okay, so in both metrics, the performance has become worse. But the interesting thing is that after about 200 cells with this flipped contingency, the animal is able to learn this now new mapping. So basically what the animal will learn is that, okay, this uh, part of the activity space is not working anymore. So I have to do this. You have to have neuron one low, neuron two high, and then you'll be able to move the cursor right. And then, so the performance is going to recover. So it's not as good as it was before, right? It's not consistently 100%, but it's uh, close to 100% and the acquisition time has also gone back down. So now it's something like two seconds on each trial that uh, the monkey takes to achieve this. Okay, so uh, if you wanna ask anything, ask now, but basically the point is that you can flip the contingency and the animal will learn this new mapping. Okay. Um, Amrita. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask that if, uh, and that in, the, in the initial trials where we had a 100% uh, success rate, so how can yeah. we be sure that the monkey was him, like uh, himself moving the cursor? Like why it wasn't just some random um, firing rate which made it move to a, a cursor? That's a great question. So uh, first of all, uh, over here I'm showing you only two targets, but in the real experiment there are eight targets and the monkey has to move to a particular target. So you can look at the trajectories that the cursor takes on different trials. And I haven't showed it here, but if you look at, uh, I think in supplementary figure two or something of the paper, they show you the trajectories that the monkey takes for different trials. And you can see that it looks very non-random. So when the monkey has to go to the northeast cursor, it will kind of go directly there without randomly moving around anywhere else. And if it has to go in some other direction, it goes directly there. So that's the first biggest indicator that the monkey is actually doing something to move it uh, because it's not random. Uh, and then the second thing is that, uh, okay, let me see. So you want to differentiate between the monkey doing this on purpose versus it happening randomly. So, okay, it'll be dependent on reward. So if you don't give the monkey a reward for the cursor actually reaching the target position, then the neural activity will not uh, go in this direction. Right, so the uh, behavior is dependent on the monkey getting a reward. And that's how we know that the monkey is doing it uh, purposely. Uh, of course, you can get into like philosophical arguments that maybe it's just like a machine, you know, that when it gets a reward for doing something, it does that. And there's no like uh, free will here. The monkey is not choosing to do that. But that's kind of beyond the scope of this. So what you need to know is that uh, you have a brain, you, uh, make this mapping from neural activity to cursor position and when you give that monkey or you're giving the brain some reward then it can learn to do this um, so it depends on the reward if you don't give a reward it won't happen i hope that answers your question Amrita? Sure. thanks yeah um, hello. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask that uh, didn't the monkey take some time to learn that particular task? Like, how did he show 100% success yeah, rate yeah, from yeah. the first trial? Yeah. Itself? That's a great question. So, this is actually not the first trial that the monkey has ever done of this task. The monkey has actually gone through months of training to get here. It's just the first trial that it did on this particular day. Okay. Uh, and they don't show the learning curve that the monkey goes through. And there's actually quite a uh, detailed learning process. So initially, there are no electrodes, no neural activity. The monkey is simply controlling the cursor with a joystick that is moved by hand. And the cool thing is that the hand movement is also controlled by the motor cortex. It's the same region where they're recording neural activity. So in some sense, the monkey is already connected neural activity in that brain region to movement of the cursor by moving a joystick. Uh, and then they take away the joystick, they put in the electrodes, and then the neural activity controls the cursor. And then initially, the cursor just moves around randomly. The monkey has no idea what to do uh, because its hands are now tight. There's no joystick. But uh, the, on some fraction of trials, the cursor will happen to randomly uh, 
achieve the correct trial and so soon the monkey will realize you know what is happening uh, to make the cursor go in the correct position and then it is able to uh, slowly acquire this uh, 100% performance so you're completely right it does not do this from trial 1 this is just trial 1 of one day on a particular day after like, months of training thank you that's what yeah. i also wanted to confirm उटिंग this uh, this particular circuit corresponds to moving the cursor in a particular direction so say like after a while doesn't like the monkey uh, forget it and it has to be relearned uh yeah so they do this every day so in the 24 hours that pass between the end of one session and the starting of the next session the monkey does not forget uh and then they do this every day for a long time now i don't know how much time would actually have to pass for the monkey to forget but i think it will be a really long time like i think my guess would be that even if you don't do this for a month and you bring the monkey back that it will still remember because remember that monkeys are first of all they are very intelligent animals and so if you think about yourself right like you learn to ride a bicycle you learn that you control your brain activity in a certain way that makes your legs and your arms and your whole body balance in a certain way and that makes the cycle go and you don't fall down first few times you do fall down and so that's a negative reward which teaches you not to do certain kind of neural activity uh and then uh you can you remember that even after like 20 years if you've never ridden a bicycle in that much time right so there's something called long term memory your brain remembers the relationship between some neural activity and some outcome and so similarly when you teach an animal like this to do something like this it uh, is maintained in long term memory and i my guess would be that it would last for a long time like up to a month or something but in this case they don't test that they teach the animal every day so the duration where it's not actually doing anything is probably like 24 hours max okay thank you hi amrita so yeah. i wanted to uh, ask that can we say in this case that the main thing in this process was for the monkeys to learn how to map the neural activity to uh, this control the speed and direction and uh, when they are able to learn how to map that then even if we change the game or i mean even if we change the task they as they know how to map the neuron controlling activity and map them to any task then uh, so as we can see here when we reverse the uh, direction it took them less time to adapt to that yeah exactly so that's exactly the finding that they're showing here that uh, it takes i mean they haven't shown it here but it takes a very long time to learn this in the first place and then if you change this one aspect of the task that you just flip the direction then it's learned very quickly in like 200 trials right so um yes that is what they're saying okay thanks yeah but of course the interesting question is uh that you can change the task in other ways right you can do something completely new and how much time does that take to learn so that's exactly where they're trying to go and then the cool thing is that uh when you flip it back so now you go back to the original thing so suddenly uh, when the neural activity is here again the cursor is moving left you've gone back to the original mapping again there's a drop in performance as you can see here um right so the performance falls but not as much as initially and then the uh, acquisition time doesn't fall at all and the neuron uh, sorry the monkey can learn the original mapping again much faster than it could learn this new mapping so for the new mapping it takes something like 200 trials and uh, the original mapping when you go back to it it's learned again in about 100 trials and the acquisition time goes back down to where it used to be 
so the interesting thing is that there is some uh, memory of this initial thing preserved even when the animal learns this new mapping and uh, so they're going to call this uh, kind of change that they did a within manifold perturbation and it will become clear why they use that terminology in a second but i hope it's clear to you you all what they did here they uh, taught the monkey some initial mapping over many months it was uh, at 100% performance then they flipped the directions of cursor movement they changed it back to what it used to be the performance recovered uh, faster than before acquisition time went down to what it used to be okay now another kind of perturbation that they can do is an outside manifold perturbation so what this means is that the neural activity we know it uh, usually falls along this intrinsic manifold so when neuron 1 is high usually neuron 2 is low now what you can do is you can say that instead of the left right movement depending on the position of the activity in this direction we are going to make it depend on the position of activity in this orthogonal direction so we're going to say that there's some threshold if both neuron 1 and neuron 2 are above that threshold that is neuron 1 high neuron 2 high then the cursor will move right and if neuron 1 and neuron 2 are both below that threshold then the cursor will move left now i hope that the problem with this kind of a mapping is obvious to you guys and the problem is that the neural activity naturally does not vary much in this direction right the variance of these points is mostly in this direction so if the monkey has to move the cursor to the right it's going to have to try to get these points and avoid these points but it just doesn't have any naturally occurring neural activity up here which would be uh, like make the cursor move right uh, much more easily in some sense right and it doesn't have neural activity down here either so this um, neural activity the hypothesis is that this kind of um, mapping is going to be difficult for the monkey to learn and uh, similarly uh, the opposite uh, activity is required to make the cursor move in the left direction so is it clear to everyone why this is an outside manifold perturbation and the previous thing was a within manifold perturbation of the mapping um i guess it's clear if no one said anything um uh, okay so now let's see what happens when you do this so as predicted when you do an outside manifold perturbation and that's what's shown here in this blue part the performance of the animal drops so this is similar to the within manifold perturbation right the performance drops but then it stays low for quite a long time so here they did 1000 trials during which the monkey was not able to recover back to the 100% performance that it had originally and the acquisition time also stays at something like 3 uh, seconds and it doesn't go anywhere below uh, what it was so the uh, result is that outside manifold perturbation when you try to make the neural activity go in a direction which it does not naturally go uh then this is more difficult for the monkey to learn and then what's really interesting is that if you go back to the original mapping so now again we flipped the arrow right it used to be like this now we made it back to what it used to be again this is the natural direction of variation of the neural activity then the uh, performance recovers immediately basically without taking any time so what this means is that the animal never forgot this mapping this mapping was always always present nothing new was learned here and when you went back to the original mapping it came back immediately now you should contrast this to the previous perturbation within manifold where it did take the animal some number of trials to again go back to its original performance right so this kind of demonstrates that when you try to make the neural activity go outside of its natural manifold uh that the animal does not learn anything no new mapping is learned and when you go back to the original mapping it's still present and the animal recovers immediately so i'll pause again for question because this is kind of the main finding of the paper amrita yes uh while performing uh, the study um like instead of letting the monkey learn the uh, within manifold perturbation uh, through the within manifold perturbation um technique uh, uh did did you also try letting him learn 
from the very beginning the outside manifold perturbation and then uh, trying his uh, like looking for his performance in the uh, within uh, manifold perturbation trials okay so one thing i should make very clear is that this is not my work uh, this is a paper that i'm presenting right uh, and i showed the names of the authors at the beginning i haven't like cited the paper in every single slide but these are all figures from that paper so this is not my work uh, i'm just presenting somebody else's work um so i haven't done anything personally with these animals in fact yeah anyway uh, but uh, the question is that's a good question so i think what you're asking is that um if the within manifold perturbation is learned first and if the hmm. outside manifold perturbation is learned second then it's possible that the hmm. monkey already understand what is the within manifold perturbation and then this outside manifold mm. is difficult because it's trying to flip things within manifold and it doesn't know what to do right so the yeah. way that they get around this um, confound is that they basically don't do these uh, different perturbations in the same session on the same day so they have on different days they have within manifold and outside manifold and i'll show you soon it's basically interleaved so they'll have uh, the animal will first be trained for a few months and then over the course of uh, one month like in 30 days there'll be 15 days of within manifold and 15 days of outside manifold so this is what the monkey does in one day around some 1500 trials and those are the interleaved so there'll be one day within one day outside then maybe again outside manifold uh, one day within manifold it will be completely random so the history is kind of um, uniform across these two conditions Uh, and what that means is that when an animal is doing a within manifold perturbation or outside manifold perturbation it's equally likely that on the previous day he was doing a within manifold or an outside manifold i hope that makes sense so basically they're trying to remove the history dependence and they show that um it doesn't matter what the animal has previously learned uh, that an outside manifold perturbation is always more difficult than a within manifold and i'll show you those results in a bit um actually uh, like i uh, i got that point that outside manifold perturbation would be tougher to learn than inside manifold perturbation uh, what i actually uh, wanted to know was that did they also look for latent learning like for example in skinner's experiments uh, with his rats so uh, for 10 days it seemed like the rats hadn't learned anything uh, because they were not getting any reward but on the 11th day suddenly they showed a sharp peak in uh, performance so here okay. uh, instead so of beginning with go. the sorry go ahead finish your question yeah so instead of beginning with the um, within manifold perturbation and trying to uh, make the uh, monkey learn from uh, that particular um, uh, th- like through that particular uh, technique if we had Uh, already begun with the outside manifold perturbations maybe uh, the monkey had learned something uh, latently which we uh, couldn't really capture uh, through the means of the study okay so okay i will try to answer your question with this figure so basically what being shown here on x axis is the session number and on y axis is the amount of learning and the blue dots are outside manifold sessions and the red dots are within manifold sessions so uh, i hope you can see from here that they are quite interleaved so this monkey in fact first had an outside two outside manifold perturbations then a within manifold and so on uh, and you can see that the red dots are separated from the blue dots and the same, same is for the other monkey now if you are asking that um before this whole thing started if the animal had initially been you were initially trying to make the activity go outside its intrinsic manifold so that wouldn't be a perturbation right that would be the original mapping so i think what you're saying is that if this original mapping itself was outside manifold in some sense then what would happen so the yeah. answer to that question is that the animal would not be able to perform an outside manifold mapping not perturbation just an outside manifold mapping as well as it can perform a within manifold mapping with no previous training and that has not been shown in this paper but uh, i know that from basically talking to these people so the way that uh, the brain control interface experiments are done 
is uh, you initially measure, just you measure the neural activity with the electrodes and you find what is its intrinsic manifold. And uh, you make a mapping from that manifold to the cursor velocity. And the reason they do this is because that is the easiest thing for the animals to learn. So if you try initially that you find some intrinsic manifold and the very first mapping that you present to the animal is outside that manifold, then the animal won't learn it at all. And uh, that's a great question that you asked. And I think that they could have showed it here, but uh, they haven't. And I just know that from like having conversations with these people. And so the motivation that they have for actually doing it this way and making it easy for the animal to learn is because you should remember that the um, kind of purpose of brain control interfaces is actually to help uh, human beings who have lost their motor control. So if you know of like, patients who are like fully paralyzed and stuff like that, brain control interfaces are supposed to help them to um, communicate with the outside world. Right, so there are cases of people who learn to manipulate robot arms using their neural activity. Uh, there are people who learn to type um, like the keys of a keyboard by manipulating neural activity. So if you say that, uh, you know, if your neural activity is here, then we'll type uh, Y, and if your neural activity is here, then we'll type no. And you can answer simple questions like, do you want to get up Y or no or etc. Right. So um, if you try to initially make the mapping as easy as possible for such a patient or an animal to learn, then it turns out that the easiest way to do it is to stay within the natural manifold of the neural activity. So that's the motivation for doing it this way, because you're actually trying to help patients who can't communicate with the world in a normal way. So you want to achieve maximum um, accuracy of the mapping from the neural activity to the cursor or the keyboard or computer or robot arm or whatever you're trying to control. Uh, and that's why they do it um, this way, in the way that's easiest for the patient or the animal to learn. And that happens to be a mapping from intrinsic manifold to the thing. And so um, now if you, do it in the other way. Like if you do, start with the outside manifold mapping, then whether it would be easy for the animal to change to a within manifold mapping is a great question. And we don't know the answer to that. And my guess is that it would be easier um, than what they're trying to do here with the outside manifold perturbation. Because, okay. uh, Thank you. yeah, it's, it's difficult to learn an outside manifold mapping in the first place. Thank you so much. Awesome question. Okay, keep it coming, folks. Is there anything else to ask? Okay, I think I'll um, move on now. So this is all well and good. This is an example session I've showed you. But the question is, is it always like this? So the way that they quantify that is they look at this so-called raw learning vector, and that is a very simple concept. Uh, they basically look at the success rate and the acquisition time, which is the two things that are shown on this graph, right? And uh, if you plot the success rate on x-axis and acquisition time on the y-axis, then you can uh, have a particular point where the animal started and a particular point where the animal ended up. So basically, if you start here and you end up here, uh, then you're doing well because your initially your success rate was low and uh, acquisition time was high and then you moved here. So now you got a higher success, um, higher success rate and a lower acquisition time. I don't know why they've showed it here as like minus 40 to zero, but whatever, this is higher. Um, so basically what they show is that for the within manifold perturbation, which is this red thing, the vector that you draw from the initial starting point to the end point is longer than for the outside manifold perturbation, which is this one. Start here and you basically don't move at all from where you started in terms of acquisition time and um, learning success rate. And then that's what they quantify here, the length of this learning vector, right? So it's very simple. It just means that they're taking some combination of the um, success rate and the acquisition time as a measure of how much the animal has learned. And what you can see is that um, for uh, both these monkeys, this study was done with two monkeys, the average amount of learning is higher for within manifold perturbations than outside manifold perturbations. So this is a histogram where the y-axis is the number of sessions 
So there's a total of some 30 sessions and the amount of learning is on the X axis. So you can see that uh, on average, the learning for within manifold perturbations is more than for outside manifold perturbations for both of these monkeys. And they quantify the difference and it's statistically significant. All right. Um, now there are other possible explanations that one can think of for this result. So for instance, you may think that if the initial performance impairment is lower for within manifold, then that might make it easier, right? So if when you initially change the mapping, it's much more difficult with the outside manifold, then it may be the case that, yeah, you can't learn in that, that number of trials because initially your performance was impaired so much. But what they show is that uh, the initial performance impairment is comparable for within manifold and outside manifold. So basically what that means is here, from this point to this point, how much drop is there in the performance that is comparable for both these uh, perturbations. Uh, and then here they uh, calculate something called the mean principal angle. So uh, if you've done um, PCA, then I think this will be somewhat easier to understand. And basically in the uh, high dimensional space, so in the 90 dimensional uh, space, uh, you have a particular vector, which is the uh, initial uh, mapping. And then you have, uh, sorry, not a vector, you have a plane, because in the real experiment, the cursor velocity is two dimensional, right? So they're projecting from a 90 dimensional space onto a two dimensional plane, which is the cursor velocity. And so you have one two dimensional plane for the initial mapping, and then you have some other plane for the perturbed mapping. And here they're quantifying the angle between those two planes. And what they show is that the angle for the within manifold and outside manifold is basically the same. And now this is a little bit hard to understand from the 2D example that I've given you. So you do need to imagine higher dimensions. Uh, and you can imagine that within, even if the new plane is still within the 10 dimensional intrinsic manifold, in the 90 dimensional space, it can still make a large angle with the original plane of mapping. And uh, that angle can be the same for an outside manifold perturbation. So it's a little hard to visualize, but um, mathematically, you can obviously calculate angles between planes, even in high dimensions. And they show that the difference in initial mapping and final mapping angle is similar for these two types of perturbations. That's what they've shown here. And then finally, this is the required change in uh, preferred direction. So now what they're quantifying here is that if you think of a single neuron, okay, in my case, which I showed you here, you can also think of a single neuron. So in neuron one preferred direction is right. That is when neuron one's firing rate is high, then the cursor moves to the right. And for neuron two, it's left because when neuron two firing rate is high, the cursor moves left. Right. And similarly in the perturbed mapping, there can be some preferred direction of these two neurons. Now, what they're quantifying here is the average change in preferred direction of individual neurons in the original mapping and the perturbed mapping. And that they show is again the same between the two types of perturbations. And so the way that they achieve that is by careful uh, construction of the initial mapping and the perturbed mapping. Again, it's kind of hard to visualize how this is possible, but you can calculate it mathematically and they show that it's the same. Uh, does someone have a question? Um, yeah, uh, I actually wanted to know that uh, I understand that uh, these parameters have been well controlled through the uh, study, but uh, can you also explain why these parameters should be controlled in the first place? Like, uh, okay, why should question. they mean? Yeah. yeah, so the question that the study is trying to address is, is it, poss is it easier for the brain um, to change neural activity uh, in a way that is, it still remains within its intrinsic manifold than for the brain to produce activity outside its intrinsic manifold, right? That's the question that you want to answer. Now, if you, uh, if you have other variables that are correlated with this, then those could be a confound that gives you the results that you're looking for but it's not actually related to the variable that you're asking about. So let me try and come up with an example for this. 
Okay, I have a very good example. So let's say you want to answer the question: um, Are uh, men faster runners than women on average? Okay, you measure the running speed of all men. You measure the running speed of all women, and you find that on average men are faster than women. So you think you've answered this question. but there are several confounding variables and one of the confounding variables could be that on average men are taller than women and so they have longer legs and a faster stride right so if you uh, now look at the uh, distribution of height of men and women then it will be different for men and women so that could be one of the factors that explains uh, your result that men are faster than women and maybe it's just because they're taller so similarly this could be a factor that explains the difference in the results that and it uh, if this factor is actually different for these different perturbations then it may be the case that the uh, difference in performance that they observe is not related to whether the activity is within the intrinsic manifold or outside the intrinsic manifold but actually it's related to the angle uh, that they are asking the inactivity to change by so this is a confounding potentially confounding variable and they're showing that it's not actually a confound does that make sense yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense great so there are basically three different confounding variables that they are ruling out as having an effect on the um, result okay uh, and then this is something that i already showed you before so basically the animal doesn't learn to learn so one could imagine that in these first few sessions the animal is getting this outside manifold perturbation and doesn't understand it's not working whatever but maybe after 20 sessions it realizes that oh this is what the new type of perturbation is supposed to be and it starts doing it later but what they show is that even over a uh, lots of sessions the animal is not able to uh, learn this outside manifold perturbation so it's not learning to learn in some sense right um and um finally i want to talk about some like um things to think about so first of all most importantly uh, maybe when you do this kind of outside manifold perturbation you are uh, trying to get the neural activity to go outside its physiological range so maybe it's not possible for neuron 2 to fire at this high firing rate maybe it's not possible for this neuron 1 to fire at a low firing rate just because of the a uh, molecular makeup of that neuron like maybe there are too many sodium channels in this neuron and it just can't fire at this low firing rate right <coughs> so that's one potential explanation and it doesn't mean that the result is invalid it just means that um maybe the what they found here is that some kinds of neural activity are not possible right rather than saying that some kind of neural activity are more difficult to learn uh, if that makes sense Uh, and this question is not answered by this study so you would have to do something like um, measure some properties of the neurons that you're recording from and uh, actually show that those properties are similar across all the neurons and you are not asking for activity outside the physiological range of the neurons uh, then another thing to think about is the number of neurons recorded so they are recording 90 90 neurons from a brain region which has millions of neurons and so uh, they are asking for uh, this kind of uh, change in activity but maybe if you record all of the neurons then the intrinsic dimensionality is maybe a lot higher um and the changes that you are asking for are actually not outside manifold of that extremely high um dimensional activity and so on so you should keep in mind that the number of neurons recorded are a very small fraction of all of the neurons in that brain region and then of course the larger picture is what does this mean for general brain new networks so uh, when we are trying to make uh, artificial neural networks or you know when we are trying to um, understand the general principles of brain neural networks what does it mean to say that the activity is constrained within a low dimensional manifold and it can't go outside that right uh, so uh, does it mean that there are particular connections between neurons that are fixed that can't be changed or does it mean that um the like the actual output from that region is low dimensional so there are fewer neurons that are required to read out activity from that brain region than all of the neurons in that brain region i don't know what i'm saying makes complete sense 
but basically these are the kind of things that i would think about after reading this kind of a study um so i just wanted to point out some of those things and uh, that's all i have for this paper so i haven't really discussed every single thing that they put into the paper i wanted to make it more about this like general concept so please feel free to ask any questions um that i haven't gotten to yet and then after that we can also discuss general things about um like how to get into a phd or whatever else you want to talk about uh yeah hello so i wanted to ask how do you choose what new neurons to map from i mean they took about 90 neurons 90 yeah. of mapping so if there are billions of neurons how do you choose that 90 and how do you think that they are the right ones that's a great question so um there are two levels at which one could choose one is to choose a particular brain region right so the brain has many uh, parts which do different things so the first question i'll answer is how did they choose this particular brain region and then within that region how do you choose uh, neurons and the answer is you don't you just put your electrodes in and these are the neurons that happen to be next to the electrodes in the way that you put it in and it's very difficult to you know even get these many neurons 90 is a reasonably high number so you are satisfied with whatever you get so within the brain region it's random but the choice of brain region is actually pretty interesting so if you think about it what you are trying to get the animal to do is manipulate the direction of movement of a cursor right so you can ask which brain region is already suited for doing things like that moving things in particular directions and the natural answer is the part of your brain that controls your arm movement so when you're trying to move your arm you're trying to like reach out and catch something you're already moving it in some direction and you have already the neural circuits which can move things in different directions in your motor cortex which controls your arm so that's why they chose the motor cortex and the way that they train the animal to do this is that initially it's controlling a joystick so it already connects neural activity in that brain region with the cursor movement now you can imagine a similar experiment done where you put the electrode in visual cortex instead and what do you think would happen so do you think that the animal can control the activity in visual cortex to do this kind of thing that's an interesting question to think about yeah yeah um akhilesh has a question that uh, won't it be more easier for monkeys to control the cursor movements with neurons that are involved in producing such acts oh that's a great question uh, it could be yes so uh, for those of you who don't know what is a saccade a saccade is a eye movement so when you um, move your eyes around your visual field to look at things uh it turns out that you don't actually move your eyes in a smooth way so let's say you're looking at point a and you want to look at point b which are quite close to each other your eyeball your focus point won't move smoothly from point a to point b it's actually going to jump from point a to point b and that jump is called a saccade and so the question is that the brain uh, region that controls these saccadic eye movement wouldn't that be easier and i think that makes a lot of sense because number one these saccades happen in 2d right so your retina is a 2d uh, plane and then the eyeball is kind of moving in a much more two dimensional although it's not completely two dimensional because you also have focus depth of focus but it's less 3d than something like arm movement where you can basically move your arm in all kinds of trajectories which are not 2d so that's one reason i can think uh, of the saccade controlling brain region uh which is basically superior collecular being easier to do this kind of thing from but that uh, is a lot harder to access with electrodes so unfortunately neuroscience is plagued by the difficulty of doing experiments right so recording from neurons with electrodes is not an easy thing so in 1969 the study that they did had one neuron right and now they have 90 so it's like that's the pace at which these um experimental techniques kind of progress and i would say the 90 is not cutting edge like in 2020 we can record thousands of neurons not 90 neurons but ease of access still matters a lot so to do the kind of surgery where you insert electrodes into superior collecular which is in the um mid brain as opposed to the visual cortex or the motor cortex which is like on top over here is a very different thing so those parameters also come into context and 
when I was answering Mohit's question, I kind of gave this fairy tale picture that, you know, what's the best brain region you can think of to do this control? And it's not just that, it was the best brain region among accessible brain regions. So unfortunately, in systems neuroscience, that is something that you have to take into account. Just the ability of doing different experimental manipulations. Thanks, Amrita. Thank you. Um, I also had one more question. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe I missed it because I joined a few minutes late. But uh, is it necessary that a particular neuron mapping has only one manifold? So, so like uh, we performed dimensionality reduction and we came up uh, uh, with this concept that this is the manifold for this particular set. Uh, for this particular mapping we are observing. So is it necessary that mm -hmm. that is the only manifold for that particular mapping? Um, let me see if I understand your question. So when you have, when you're recording from 90 neurons, the full dimensionality of that activity is 90, right? And then the number of possible yeah. n-dimensional intrinsic manifolds within that 90 dimensional space is very high. But there's one intrinsic manifold that is actually present in the neural activity that you're recording. Um, and so, I mean, the way that you define intrinsic manifold, there's by construction, there's only one intrinsic manifold. Um, because basically what you're saying is it's the projection of that 90 dimensional vector onto a 10 dimensional space. So it's a uh, 10D projection, which best captures the variance of that neural activity. So uh, I, I can ask you, like, how many 1D intrinsic manifolds can you find in this 2D space? The answer is infinite, right? You can rotate this line in any way possible, and each of those things is an intrinsic manifold. But the reason that I'm yeah. saying that this is the intrinsic manifold is because this uh, projection maximizes the variance of the neural activity along that projection, which means that if you project each of these points onto this line, and the variance of uh, those points on, projected on that line is more than if you uh, project it onto any other line. So by construction, there's only one intrinsic manifold. It is the intrinsic manifold that maximizes the variance of the point when you project it onto that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's why when you do PCA, there's like uh, one unique first PC, right? Like um, you can define the first principal component. It's not that there's multiple choices of first principal component. It's unique because it's the one with the maximum variance. And then you have the second and third. So in some sense, when you say a 10 dimensional intrinsic manifold, it means the top 10 principal components of that 90 dimensional uh, activity. Yeah. Thank so you. it's uniquely defined. Okay, anything else? Uh, yeah, I guess it's, uh, not related to this presentation, but uh, uh, I don't know if you saw the neural link about the brain computer interface, a recent presentation. And as you work in a good lab, so what do you think about it? Is it, I mean, revolutionary or is it just what people already know? Okay, so to repeat the question, I think uh, you're asking about Elon Musk's company, Neuralink, which is trying to make brain-computer interfaces. Is that right? Yeah, I think he meant that to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. I haven't actually watched the presentation, but uh, the general consensus within the scientific community is that there's a very long way to go until we can actually do the kinds of things that these people are talking about. So the first um, and sort of the most difficult barrier to overcome in brain computer interfaces is achieving stability. So in this case, they did this for about six, what, 80 sessions. Okay. I was wrong when I said one month, it's more like two and a half months. Um, and why do you think they stopped at 80 sessions? Like, why not just do this for like a few years for this month? Uh, maybe because the electrodes were getting like uh, damaged or something? 
Exactly. So what happens is over time you'll see that the neural activity that you are recording on those electrodes is going to change. You're going to get very weird neural activity. Some of the electrodes are going to drop out entirely, so you won't see any spikes. Some of them you'll start seeing extremely high firing rates, which is a um, uh, which is a hallmark of the neuron dying, uh, and so on. So this is the maximum stability, the maximum duration for which they can get stable recordings with this particular setup. It's about two and a half months. Now, the kind of thing where you implant a brain-computer interface in a human, I mean, it better last more than two and a half months, right? Like you want to achieve some sort of stability. Otherwise, there's no point of doing this kind of thing. Um, because if you have to go and get a new brain-computer interface every two and a half months, then your brain will turn into tofu, right? It's not going to, like you can't keep inserting electrodes. So the main um, problem for brain computer interfaces is this kind of uh, electrode stability. And so the, re the place where uh, this kind of development is happening is actually in like biomaterials and coming up with the kind of electrodes which are minimally invasive, but they last for the maximum time uh, and so on. And um, actually some people in Neuralink who were trying to do these kind of experiments with rats uh, one of them ended up here at Genelia and his opinion is that it's not going in the right direction. So he thinks that this is the direction that they need to focus on, like achieving stability of electrode recording. And what they're instead trying to do is to like get electrodes into humans. So I guess it's a question of whether you focus on development within um, easier animals to work with like rats and develop the electrodes really well, or you focus on like moving to humans. And so his opinion is that they're definitely not going in the right direction. But I think that it's a very exciting field and any publicity is good publicity in some sense. So I'm very happy that this company exists and that they're trying to do this. And I'm optimistic about the kind of things they can achieve, but I think the timeline is gonna be like very slow. I think it's at least 20, 30 years before you can get a really useful brain computer interface with humans. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I have a doubt like uh, when when we talk about decision making in monkeys or humans, we say that uh, there exists uh, optimal decision making or uh, suboptimal decision making. Uh, so, does there exist uh, also some kind of this suboptimal learning in primates or humans because of the constraints that we have because of, of our brains? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, if you think about it, there are tasks which would be much easier for a computer to learn than for a human or an animal to learn. So um, I think when you say suboptimal decision making, you mean mathematically suboptimal, right? Like you're not achieving the maximum reward rate that's possible. Um, with learning, I think the definition of suboptimal would be a bit different. Like, would it be that whether you can achieve the maximum performance or how much time do you take to achieve the maximum performance? So if you're talking about time, then we're definitely suboptimal in many ways. Uh, like, there are many things that a computer would learn much faster than a human. So for instance, um, uh, let's say that you have a particular task where you play a sound of some frequency and the person has to estimate whether the uh, frequency is above um, like above um, 20 kilohertz or below 20 kilohertz okay this will take a long time to actually learn to train your ears to the point where it can very accurately distinguish those frequencies whereas for a computer it will be trivial right like there's no learning essentially it's just like above threshold yes below threshold no so are we suboptimal in terms of learning time? Yes, and that's constrained by both our brains and our physiology. Uh, and are we suboptimal in terms of eventual performance? I think the answer to that depends on the task. So if you think of a task like um, learning to ride a bicycle, it's much 
like the maximum performance that a human can achieve is much much higher than the maximum performance that like a robot can achieve right so we find it very difficult to make robots who can perform um skilled movements but then you can think about a different task like playing the game go and we used to think that humans actually achieve optimal performance but now we know that it's suboptimal because there is a computer that can defeat the best human um in uh, an average so i think it, there's like a it's not very clear what optimal learning means and i think more or less any way you describe it uh it depends on the task and there's certainly tasks you can find where humans are suboptimal and definitely animals as well like i am actually training mice to do something which is a very simple task which is that uh, if i play a high frequency sound then uh, you need to lick on the right side and you will get a reward and if i play a low frequency sound then you need to lick on the left side and you will get a reward and if a computer had to do this it would take no time at all if a human had to do this maybe it will take like five tries like five times you lick on the right side you don't get a reward and you realize oh when there's a high frequency you have to lick on the other side okay and for the mice it takes something like four weeks to learn this really simple task but that's because they're not designed to learn things like this right in nature they don't hear high frequency and low frequency pure tones they don't lick left side right side so yeah they're su- definitely suboptimal thank you so much uh, uh and uh, do you think it would be easier to train mice uh, if you use like natural sounds that has high frequency or low frequency yes it would but it would be more difficult to analyze the experiment so if you're recording yeah. in audio cortex for instance right the neural activity related to pure tone is going to be much easier to interpret than related to a natural sound which is easier for the animal to learn so there's always a trade off between um the kind of control that you have in an experiment versus how easy it is for the animal to do so if you uh, do something like a foraging task where you leave the animal in the wild and what it has to learn is the locations with maximum food okay now this is something that's very natural for the animals because that's what they do in the wild like they go around they find some like trash can which usually has good food and some other trash can which usually doesn't have food and they'll very quickly learn to go to the trash can which has food but this kind of thing is very difficult to analyze in a lab because uh, there's no control over you know uh when the animal does this how long it takes to go to these various places what is the distance between different things all these things are not controlled well so there's a trade off between interpretability of the experiment and ease of learning for the animal yeah this is great actually i work on foraging so uh, i think i'm i have chosen a bad uh, paradigm but yeah thank you so much <laughs> No, I think foraging is pretty cool, and people are trying to make it like as natural as possible while still keeping it interpretable. So I think that's a great direction to go in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Amrita, um, uh, are we not like uh, you have some time left, right? So like, uh, yeah. Should we continue? Yeah yeah I have time so let's say another like 15 minutes and I think I'll stop sharing so that we can like maybe see each other's faces or if you don't want to share video that's fine but um it will be nice if we can just like chat about other things I also want to hear about BCS and like what you guys do and um like how did it start what is the name uh yeah so I guess here we have Yatin and uh, Yatin and Yash who are the coordinators of PCS currently, and uh, Shashi Khan also who was the founder of PCS. So if they can. Yeah, go for it. yeah yash was actually uh, facing uh, some connectivity issues he had gone to his uh, was also maybe he got okay. disconnected um like uh, in general about bcs so bcs is a full form uh, brain and cognitive science society so yeah. basically um, uh, 
uh, when Shashi founded the society, uh, he he had the uh, same uh, he had almost the same objectives as any neuroscientist. So to understand uh, how the brain works and to be able to apply uh, it uh, like through technology and engineering. So uh, artificially in an artificial machine. So understanding how the brain works and then being able to apply it in the form of an artificial uh, machine. And uh, in general, like it's it's a fairly new society. Uh, we have been on for uh, around, I'd say one year only. And uh, uh, we uh, try to just inculcate a culture uh, in the campus community to explore this very exciting field and uh, yeah. uh, like interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary in nature so psychology yeah. cognitive science everything uh, uh, we are interested in and we uh, offered projects during the summer for the first time and uh, uh, they were uh, mostly on the domains of machine learning and one uh, one project uh, was on connectomics as well so uh, different projects and then we try to organize these journal club meetings uh, where we uh, try to invite uh, uh, people who are working in the field to uh, present uh, any interesting study uh, or to talk about uh, things, uh, cognitive science in general. And um, uh, yeah, and we also have a few Sekis this time. So most of them uh, joined this, uh, were a part of this meeting. So yeah. That's, so that's do you get funding from uh, SNP or they were, do you get funding, I guess, the question? Um, since it's fairly new, so it is, uh, I guess, still a hobby group uh, right oh, now. Okay. And yeah. uh, we, uh, like, uh, since this, uh, we were planning to uh, submit an application for converting it to an official club this time. But since everything is online right now, so we, uh, that process could not take place. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I we uh, uh, need any money since it's all online. This is all free, I suppose, right? Yeah, and uh, like we are free to purchase anything uh, we need from the SNT side. So we are a part of SNT just as a hobby group uh, right now. Uh, but yeah, we are free to uh, purchase anything uh, 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 that is necessary for the club. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I guess, I mean, um, when I was on campus, I knew a few people who are like interested in neuroscience, specifically within Bajpe, but I didn't know that there are so many people who would be interested, like enough to make a club. So I'm very excited about that. You guys get like lots of first years and, you know, is that, I suppose like looking at the number of people in the screen is very good. So, yeah. Yeah, they were around, uh, I'd say 80, 80, uh, 80 students who were a part of uh, summer projects wow. and uh, a bit more around I think 100 something for the workshops as well so yeah that's, that's a very amazing. healthy number yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and like more they, than they span problem. across various fields yeah yeah cool, that's man. pretty exciting cool. as well Um, yeah. I, I think Shashi, if Shashi, Shashi yes. is the founder, he, uh, he, he could tell a little bit more about the founding of BCS and uh, what was his vision. Hi, hi. Uh, sorry, I got a little late uh, and probably I'm not switching my uh, webcam because my uh, oh, room no is pretty dirty right now. <laughs> so. No worries, no worries. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, main motivation was that only what uh, Yatin told you. And then, so yeah, uh, actually, uh, in my, uh, at the end of my second and third year, so I came to, I mean, know more about this interdisciplinary field in neuroscience and AI. So I just wanted that uh, more and more IDK people could know about it. So uh, one more motivation was that that uh, many of the students do work in SNT clubs, but uh, clubs do not really focus on research kind of thing. They right, mostly, right. Oh, yeah. So engineering. I mean, it is yeah. I guess <laughs> most of the departments are engineering, so that makes sense. 
Yeah. Are there uh, profs involved? So we are yeah. trying to uh, reach with some of the profs. So in during the summer, there was one project with along with one professor also. So she is uh, she just joined uh, IITK as a I mm. guess she is a, a adjoint professor, right, uh, Yatin? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. He's She's a visiting, a visiting professor, professor in yeah. cognitive uh, uh, science department. Wait, there's a cognitive science department. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, it's only for masters and PhD uh, as of now. But yeah, there is there's a department. Whoa! When did that start? Yeah. Was it was it there when uh, I was? No, no. I guess it's two or three years old. Uh, just. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it started right. in two, 2017, I guess. Cool, cool. Very cool. And yeah, I mean, I still have like maybe 10 minutes, let's say. So if you want to talk about um, stuff that I did during and after college, we can also talk about that. Yeah, uh, uh, if you could just uh, uh, talk about like, immediately after college that how did you decide that this was the way to go because a okay. lot of people do not uh, choose this particular career trajectory yeah yeah for sure um so basically what i did during college was two internships in research labs right and um one of the internships that i did was in this place in the same lab that i'm working in right now uh, and the reason for doing those internships was that I was very interested in neuroscience and I thought I wanted to continue in like research. Um, so if I have to talk about like why research as opposed to other things, I think um, that's quite a personal decision. Like, uh, you know, what are you motivated by? Like what, what is going to make you get up in the morning and go to work? Like are you driven by curiosity, like we want to find out things about how the brain works, or are you driven more by like wanting to build things, um, like are you interested in building like robots or, you know, artificial neural networks, then you may want to go more on the industry side where like that kind of thing is more focused on. Uh, so I would say that that's a personal decision, but there's also other factors like money and, uh, you know, quality of life and so on. So for a PhD student um, in general, like if you're doing a PhD in India, then you won't be paid very well, right? And I think you guys will know, like the PhD and master students in uh, IITK itself, I don't think that they're um, doing as well like financially as what most undergrads tend to do when they go uh, elsewhere. But I would say that that's not the case in the U.S. So the PhD stipend that you get as a PhD student in the U.S. is pretty healthy. And the quality of life is um, frankly great. Like, uh, I don't think that there's anything that I'm lacking. And after doing a PhD, you have very high employability. So then if you decide, you know, you want to like really uh, earn the bucks and like go into some company, then you still will be able to do that, no problem. Um, so from that point of view, if you do want to do research and you also care about like, you know, having a good financial situation, then I would say that try to do abroad, especially in the US and the UK. Um, and uh, why this place? So the place that I'm at is called Genelia Research Campus. It's quite an unusual uh, research institute in the sense that it's not a university. So there's no undergrad here. There are no classes basically. There's mostly postdocs and some PhD students. So it's very focused on research and all, everyone is kind of very, very strongly focused on their research and nothing else. There are no administrative responsibilities. You don't have to TA any classes and so on. So that can be both good and bad. So it's good because, you know, if you really like your research, you can really get down into it and focus and like, just spend a lot of time. But it can also be very intense. And so you don't kind of get as many breaks as you would in a normal university environment. And it's kind of higher pressure. So I have found that difficult to deal with. And so I would say that before choosing to do a PhD and before choosing the place that you want to do a PhD, really ask yourself whether this is something that excites you enough to keep going even through high pressure and like intense 
uh, periods of time where you know it may be difficult to deal with these kind of things um and if you find it exciting enough uh, and if you feel that you know even if you don't meet your friends for one month it will be enough because you have a cool new result then go for it uh, and if you feel that that's not your cup of tea then don't go for it like don't feel pressure to do a phd just because people who are interested in research tend to do phd there are other ways to be interested in research and um also have like a better work life balance i would say um yeah and then so why i chose this particular lab is because when i did the summer internship um i had a lot of fun i really enjoyed working here and i thought that the kind of work that they were doing is very cool and like cutting edge um and the equipment that they have is pretty cutting edge like they have very fancy microscopes and uh, recording kind of um mechanisms that are um not found in many other places um and also the prof that i'm working with uh, i kind of got along pretty well with him and he uh encouraged me to join his lab so i thought that you know that's something that is going to be pretty rare like even if i go to a university i'm not going to find a prof who's telling me you know come to my lab come to my lab it's difficult to find that kind of a thing um so i just went for it because i thought you know it's a rare opportunity and i better take it yeah yeah that's that seems pretty nice and that that's kind of the thing i also want to do uh, personally as well but like you mentioned that there are other ways to um, be interested in research and not do a phd so, so could you describe what are those other opportunities one could explore yeah so uh, i mean i think science itself has a few things that you can do so there's something called science writing um which is where you may not do the experiments and the work yourself but you write about it so there are uh, people who write for scientific magazines uh, like you know the editors of these uh, big journals will uh, be people who have a strong background in science but they don't actually do the science themselves so they they kind of curators of science in some sense uh you can think of it that way uh and that's a reasonably big space which you can go into of course you need to enjoy writing to do that um but if you enjoy science don't want to do the actual experiments but uh, you want to be up to date and you do like writing then i would say that that's one place you can go uh you can do science policy so in the government there will be people who advise the government who are not actually scientists but they need to have a very strong understanding and um, be up to date with science right so you could be interested in research and you could do science policy uh, and i think especially in the us that's pretty like well fleshed out and in india i don't know i haven't explored as much but it is something that i've considered uh, if i do want to become a professor then it's something i can do like advise the government about um, you know where to distribute money in science and how to best exit best make use of the resources that we have um like you know in all the scientific institutes and so on um and then of course there's the whole um industry so depending on what kind of thing you're interested in um you could go to a uh, pharmaceutical industry you could join the kind of um companies that manufacture um equipment that scientists use so genelia actually has contracts with a lot of companies that uh, make the equipment and the software that we use as researchers so you could be basically a software um, software engineer who builds tools for scientists uh if that makes sense um and so there are like hundreds of such companies uh there's like you could be someone who manufactures really fast cameras for like very high end recording of behavior and neural activity and so on um and there i think it's like basically open to people of any background and you don't have to have a biology background to do something like that right um and then there's like pharmaceutical industry there's um uh what else is like obviously the whole data scientist you can be a data scientist in basically any company um you say and uh Yeah, I think that's all I can think of for now. But there are many things you can do. 
thank you thank you so much um, um like uh, we won't take any more uh, time of you uh, like we know you are quite busy and uh, you yourself mentioned that it's very uh, like it's great hard work at genelia so uh, i'd like to really thank you for this uh, very amazing talk and uh, also i uh, i personally felt and i'm sure a lot of the other attendees felt this too that usually uh, uh, when we attend uh, the talks and seminars of professors so sometimes they get a little too technical and uh, it's it, there, there are a lot of details and it, it gets really tough to grasp but here it seemed that like almost uh, a a batchmate was explaining a concept to us so it was uh, uh, it was really nice and uh, I, i'm That's it was thing, really I enjoyable really as well. yeah, yeah i also had a lot of fun and um, if you guys want to reach out and ask me questions later on feel free to email me and i think you you have my email id right so um I think that's the best way to contact me if you have questions later on, and, and I'll do my best to answer. I don't promise that I can like help all of you find internships or something, but I'll 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 answer whatever I can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. It was great, and good luck to all of you. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure. Man. All right. Best of luck. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.